Good afternoon. I am Nick Rishwain, and I'm the Vice President of Client Relations and Development for Experts.com. And with me today is one of our members, uh, Frederick Fisher. Uh, Fred has uh, been in the insurance industry for near 40 years, and more he years. more than 40 years. 41. 41. And he is a, an expert witness in professional liability and specialty lines of insurance. And Fred, you wanted to kind of start off today a little bit about your expert witness philosophy, and then we'll go into a few other topics. Am I right with that? Is that what your thought was? Oh, yeah. Uh, Nick, I've been uh, testifying on and off uh, for the last 30 years or more. And even though I was, you know, I was the head of my own claim adjusting and risk management company, as well as eventually as a wholesale broker, I always had two or three cases that I was handling at any given point in time, uh, if only to keep my skills sharp and, and stay involved. Uh, but one of the luxuries of that was the fact that I, I could afford to only take those cases that I either agreed with or if there was a specific issue or issues that I was asked to opine on, that again, I could limit myself to only those cases and issues that I truly agreed with. And I think that gave me a high degree of credibility, not only with the court. Um, of course, uh, if it was a jury trial, I think it gave me a high degree of credibility with the jurors as well. And as a result, I can honestly say that over that 30 year period, with the exception of um, appellate courts or appellate decisions that may have changed the law or statutory and regulatory changes uh, or in a different state that may differ from California, um, my testimony over the last 30 years, with those exceptions, has been 100 percent consistent. Um, actually, uh, in a deposition I gave in 2009, and I'll read this to you. Please. Uh, I, was at, I, was I was asked a series of questions that I thought was very pertinent. Um, do I, um, and I'll start out, uh, do I, do you have any expectation I will receive any additional compensation depending on the result of the case? Absolutely not was my answer. And then the next question was, do I receive any benefit if the plaintiffs prevail in this case? And again, the answer was absolutely not. Then I was asked, do I believe that I have an obligation as an expert to be independent, to render my opinions? And again, that is my, that I answered that is my understanding. Do you believe that I have an obligation in a case in rendering opinions to be objective? And again, my, my answer was yes, okay. or yes, sir, actually. And finally, do I believe that I have an obligation in rendering my opinions in the case to provide those opinions honestly, no matter which side uh, they may benefit? And again, my answer was absolutely. And, and that's how I've testified over the years. And, and again, I think it's given me a high degree of credibility and has allowed me to be relatively consistent uh, for a very long time. And the, 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 that decision brings uh, really some uh, additional topics that we can talk about. It sounds like the first two points that you had to, that you had to answer there were kind of contingency based yes. questions, right? Are yes. you are you going to receive any sort of contingency fee associated with your testimony? And that should be across the board for every expert that no, I am not getting paid on a contingency basis. Uh, laws throughout the 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 states have generally required that that not be the case that oh, yeah that an expert in in all fields not be paid on a contingency basis because what does that do that will limit your objectivity won't it and it That's really harms your, your your credibility correct. Uh, and and you the other thing you mentioned that i think we should touch on because it is important as an expert uh is that you are able to kind of pick and choose the cases you want to take that you know the experts sometimes will get that that uh accused of being a hired gun right and only and, and taking every case that comes their way you had a level of success uh before before your expert witnessing from what i'm hearing and that allowed you to i'm going to take this case that I can that I can opine on, and that has kept you uh, allowed you to stay credible and, and unbiased in and take cases for both plaintiff and defense. Is that am I right in that? That is correct. Um, actually, uh, at any given point in time, I usually uh, I must have a 60-40 split 
but between testifying for the defense as opposed to testifying for the plaintiff. And, but it does shift here or there depending on sure. you know, what the point of time is. But again, I, like I say, I only take cases I agree with. And you know, given my area of specialty, which we can get into in a moment, um, it's a small world. People talk. And the last thing I want to have happen is to be cross-examined with a deposition I gave two years ago that's completely inconsistent with the deposition I'm giving today simply because I'm testifying for one side or another this time. And that is something, again, I can honestly say I don't think I, is uh, something I have to ever have to worry about. Yeah. And that, and it will come back to bite you. I, you see, I see the articles. We post them on our Twitter feed uh, once in a while when they come out. That you know, if you if you have a lack in credibility at some point, comes back to bite you, and then you're not testifying ever again. When, once it's out there and and people find out about it, it's pretty hard to get work as an expert witness after that. Well, sure, but the, you raise a good point too. I mean, over the years, I've published over sixty-four articles uh, in in various trade magazines and what have you, uh, as well as a book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's in, in addition to you know the quote-unquote blogging I do on LinkedIn, etc. And you know, I used to say my biggest fear as an insurance broker or as an independent adjuster was being cross-examined with my own articles. But that was in the context of my being a defendant uh, as opposed to being an expert witness. Okay. Uh, somebody tries to te- tries to cross examine me with my own articles, when I'm testifying as an expert witness. Uh, they better be really careful because I know why I wrote that article. Right. I know what was behind it, and sometimes they tried to treat uh, trip me up with that, and it's actually backfired. And, and it's been it's been an ongoing issue with us trying to get our members to produce content because it's important for people to get to understand your knowledge and your abilities. Uh, so we try and get them to produce, produce just the way that you're doing this with me right now. It, not everybody is comfortable with it. Uh, mm-hmm. And and when I when I talked to Mitch Jackson, he was the 2013 California Lawyer of the Year. Uh, and and I asked him, you know, what how would he advise uh, advise expert witnesses as far as getting on these live streaming and, and embracing digital platforms and producing content and things like that. And his thing was, look, if you're afraid that something you say on one of these sites or something that you produce is going to come back and bite you, then you really got to think about what you're writing and what you're producing. Uh, that uh, They may try and use it, but it sounds like you're comfortable uh, defending every one of the articles that you've written. Well, I think that's true. And I think uh, one of the reasons for it is, is the underlying current of many of the articles I've written is coming from the standpoint of, quote, unquote, and, and there is no legal precedent for this, unfortunately. But it all comes from the standpoint of doing the right thing. Right. When I was handling claims, uh, again, you know, my background has been professional liability since 1975. And starting in 1975, I, I was a claim adjuster while I was in law school, mm-hmm. investigating cases against insurance agents and brokers and real estate agents and brokers. We even had Seedman's e and cases involving seed manufacturers for all agricultural purposes. Like, you know, lettuce seeds. And, and, and I, I think we should bring that case up just because it's a real yeah, we, cool fact pattern when we get when we get down. But go ahead. I'm sorry. About that. Uh, but and then, of course, as an insurance broker, I was still writing articles on, on best practices and how to prevent claims from being made against you as opposed to how to win them. And again, it always came from the standpoint of uh, doing the right thing. I mean, let's not forget, forget something. Insurance in general. What are we selling? I, I I know now because we've had a couple of conversations, but I like, tell me the why behind what it's you It's simple. Sell. We're selling one of the most, what, what can be, especially in commercial lines and specialty lines, specialty lines being E&O and errors and emissions and director and officer liability, et cetera. Um, we're selling probably one of the most complex intangibles there is. And what that really boils down to, as far as I was concerned, is we're selling how the insurance company responds when needed. And either they're going to get involved in suing your insurance over uh, insured over some gotcha uh, that nobody caught, or they're going to live up to their obligation and do what they should do based on the reasonable, and I, I think that's very important, yeah. very reasonable expectation of the insured in having them respond in the manner in which they should based on what he bought. And what that really boils down to, that's it's how they respond. 
exactly. how they respond and insurance is really when I'm buying insurance, I'm buying what? I'm buying financial security, correct? Financial security. That's exactly right. That's what I always said as a broker. Right. I'm a wholesale broker. We all right, we were a wholesale broker. We really didn't deal directly with the consumer and was authorized by the retail broker who wanted us to get involved in a conference call or something. Uh -huh. But the one that showed of it was Yes, we were a wholesale insurance broker. That was the business model we chose, and it was how we were licensed as brokers and surface line brokers. But in reality, we were out to provide financial security. We wanted to reduce uncertainties in the contract. We wanted to try and identify and correct ambiguities. And therefore, the, you know, good paper makes good friends, as they often say. Yeah. And yeah. That way, I didn't have to worry about my policyholder having a problem with a carrier when he needed them. And right. there's plenty of gotchas in these policies. Let me tell you. Tell me about a gotcha uh, a gotcha clause or a gotcha policy because you brought it up uh, in some of our previous conversations, but I don't know that we delved into it. What would somebody like myself? Well, let me, let me point out my two favorites. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, but let's keep bear in mind that when it comes to director and officer liability and specialty lines, errors and emissions, employment practice, fiduciary liability, malpractice insurance. Uh, cyber liability, those types of coverages, there is no standardization. They're not ISO written forms that everybody uses and borrows and whatever. These Every every insurance company has their own policy form. Okay. Number, number two, uh, they're all written on what's called a claims made and mostly a claims made on a reported basis. And what that means is, is that the demand for money or services in general, that's a generalized definition, but the demand must be first made against the insured during the policy term, and the insured also has to report that claim to the insurance company during the policy term or during some extended reporting provision or an automatic grace period if there is one. Okay. And so those are two major uh, triggers to the policy form, and there, and there could be others like you know prior act dates and what have you. Okay. Now, if it's a claims made a reported policy, one of the first things I used to do as a broker reviewing a form before I quoted it was to look at the definition of claim. Okay. And again, there's 100 insurance companies uh, with 100 policies out there. There could be 100 different definitions of claim. But consider this. What if the definition of claim is A, I lost it. Okay. B, the initiation of an administrative proceeding. C, a demand letter. Okay. None of those require a receipt by the insured. So I I'm something you don't know about. So I'm sitting here as a business and one of those three things happens. I'm unaware of it. So how do I report it? Exactly. You don't know. Okay. And sometimes you may not find out, especially if, if the uh, policy is coming up on re for renewal real soon. And as I've said, time and time again, time again, the most dangerous time for an insured with a claims made policy is at or around renewal. Okay. And uh, it's amazing how many claims have fallen through the cracks because it wasn't reported in a timely manner or reported to where it needed to be reported in a timely manner. And what might have otherwise have been covered is now not covered, even when in re renewing with the same insurance company. How crazy is that? Yeah. But, uh, it has happened. As a matter of fact, in the last 12 months, there's probably been over 60 appellate decisions upholding claim denials by insurance companies uh, for either not reporting a claim in a timely manner, not disclosing a claim in a t on the application, uh, or worse, uh, not just uh, reporting what's called an incident, uh, where you're aware of factors, circumstances that might give rise to a claim, but no one's going to demand against you yet. But most of these policies do have a provision where if you report that incident, to an insurance company and provide sufficient detail as may be required in the policy, if a claim is later made, you'll be covered. And it's and like I said, it's been 60. And um, that's, are, you're saying nationwide, I'm assuming. Nationwide, okay. yes. And that, that, to me, that's inexcusable. Yeah. We, there was even an, an attorney who was aware of a default that had been taken by uh, on, on a, a case that he was handling for a client. Mm -hmm. Thought he could appeal it all uh, all the way and get it reversed and didn't. But when that default first took place, he decided he wasn't going to report it to his then E&O carrier as a possible incident that could give rise to a claim. He stayed silent and never even disclosed it on his application. 
So, and, and often these applications have a warranty question asking words to the effect, are you aware of any facts or circumstances that could give rise to a claim or lead any reasonable person to think that a claim may later be made? And he answered no. Not only did the court uphold the denial to his current E&O carrier, right. uh, because it wasn't it was a claim that had been made prior, uh, two years earlier, but they also said the policy was void for, for misrepresentation on the application. Well, I would, uh, I would, I would think. think. Are you getting, are you getting a little back on me? me? Pardon? Getting, getting uh, an echo, echo on my mind? No. Okay. Uh, oh, Stephanie's getting an echo. Is it? Stephanie, let me know if it's gone. I'm not hearing it any longer. Um, I should ask, no more echo, good, okay. Um, I should say, or we should comment that in that situation, I can't imagine uh, with the legal education behind me that uh, an attorney would be consider considered a reasonable well, person in that, in that situation, right? He would be, I would assume he'd be- be Split hairs. Yeah, I would assume that he'd be held to a different standard, though. Which may may did that play? Do you know if that played into the denial and the void? I think it may have. I haven't read the entire decision. I only read the summary on it, but um, I, it, it could have. But the lawyers, by nature, are, are, are trained to split hairs, right? And this is where doing so is going to come back to haunt you. Yeah, yeah. It is a reasonable man. It is a reasonable test in most states. And uh, or, or and it, so whether you're an attorney or not may may not make a difference. Yeah, yeah. I just know in some search in some circumstances that they're held to the higher standard, certainly in in how they treat. So I was, it was just sort of uh, uh, of interest. Uh, not that it's pertinent, real pertinent to this, but I wondered if if that's possibly why they uh, they said sorry. This is now void. Well. But, and in those 60 cases I mentioned earlier, there were several cases against lawyers who Interesting. didn't report a claim or didn't report uh, an incident in the time you matter. And, and, you know, it's just bizarre. But mm -hmm. remember, too, that often, um, and, and I don't want to paint too broad a brush with this, sure. but litigating attorneys, you know, the mindset of a litigator can often be reduced to two words, and that is, make me. <laughs> That's true. There, there is some truth to that. They're used to fighting, and and you gotta kind of force it. Yeah, and that's you know when it comes to reporting a, a policy and having the financial security you want and need at the time somebody wants to make a claim against you, that's not a time to play. With you. Right, that's right. So, it, in some of our previous conversations, we had touched on. I had asked you to. Um, think about some fascinating cases that you had worked on. Uh, one you mentioned a, a few minutes ago that I found pretty fascinating when we initially talked about the, the agricultural seed. Uh, the, because I was, on, I mean, I live in an agricultural area here in the Central Valley. Well, I, I wasn't an expert in that case. I was investigating it for. That's right. That's but, right. But uh, I'll, so I'll, maybe you can tell us how, you know, that might give the listener a, a little idea of how a specialty line uh, or, or this type of uh, liability insurance might work. Well, this was in 1975 or 1976. And uh, so uh, bear that in mind with some of the dollar sure. figures. But even there, the policy had a $100,000 deductible. Okay. So that's today, we got almost a million. Yeah. I mean, that was like, wow, I mean, I've never seen anything like that. I'd seen limits for 100000 but I hadn't seen yeah. a, a deductible. That's a major well, deductible. What they did is they, manu they, they provided uh, lettuce seed, I think it was, to uh, people that were going to plant lettuce in the Central Valley. And often they would rent a large plot of land. In this case, I think it was 5,500 acres. And they bought enough seed to plant 5,500 acres. And, and apparently this kind of lettuce had a, a seed that was about the size of a caraway seed, really tiny. Okay. No idea how scientific this uh, farming was even way back then. They actually um, were supposed to plant one seed every six inches. Okay. And eventually, depending on emergence and vigor are the key words, um, they would then uh, thin it down to maybe one plant every foot. Okay. Right? So that's a lot of plant uh, seedlings that would sprout and then sure. all of a sudden thin down. Um, 
none of the seeds. Got, and of course, part of the process when you're dealing with seeds that tiny, how do you get such exact planting? Okay. So the only way to do it is somebody came up with a, with a concept years ago of almost like it's the same machinery by which you would make a solid pill. Okay. Coat this tiny little seed with clay, um, a clay, a mixture of clay that would dissolve with water and, and turn it into the size of a large BB. Okay. And then with that, you could use a mechanical planter and get exact planting the way you wanted. And, the, and that's amazing to me, even today. And you're saying this was technology four years ago. Yeah, well, yeah 75. Yeah. So what was interesting, though, is that part of that process and for each different manufacturer to try and distance themselves or, or uh, from, from competitors was they would put uh, nutrients and fertilizers in with the clay mixture to help give stronger vigor and, uh, and emergence. I don't even know what those terms mean. But I have I have a concept of what. Right, right. I suppose it was going to help grow right. a better crop. And what happened was, nothing grew. 50, nothing at all. Fifty five hundred acres. It was like dead. <laughs> so it was like, uh oh, what happened? And you know, ultimately, it turned out that the the, uh, uh, the temperature of the mixing equipment in, in coating the seed and creating these BB like material, BB like seeds. Uh, the temperature was too high and they killed the germ. Ah, and so they have a hundred thousand dollar deductible. This is who they, who do they hold responsible? They, they hold the, the farmer, the guy who's planting all that seed is holding the manufacturer. Compliant. And, and the manufacturer's insurance company then had to defend them in this case. Is that, and settle it. Yeah. And settle it. It was underwriters. It was. That's fin That's, and that was back then a hundred thousand dollar deductible, and uh, which would probably, like you said, be a million dollar deductible today. Settling on fifty five hundred acres worth of uh, the value, uh, you know, is astronomical. Uh, it, so that one interested me because I'm in this ag area, and it is it's an interesting uh, interesting case, and and not often how we as a consumer think of insurance, right? Uh, but you had another uh, that was uh, a large company, and this was a more recent case. They're, they're one of the top uh, probably 40 largest insurance companies in the country, if not in the world. Uh, the insurance broker, yeah. Insurance broker, thank you. Well, what I happened in this I case? It was as good a time as any to bring up what I, what I consider my area as a specialty. Okay. Uh, having written so many articles on the subject and, and speeches on claim prevention on the topic uh, i'm very comfortable testifying as to the standard of care of insurance agents and brokers whether they be captive agents or uh, brokers appointed agents wholesale brokers in particular uh mg uh, managing general underwriters and agencies i'm very comfortable with that uh, i'm also comfortable with the duties and obligations of real estate agents and brokers uh having written a book called broker in real estate within the law I have handled claims against accountants, but it depends on the nature of the alleged error. And in this, in the case, in one case I testified to, they were they were certainly acting as uh, uh, the accounting firm for uh, the client, uh, the client, but they were also acting as they had one individual was actually the chief financial officer at the same time, and providing consulting advice. And in that area, based on the nature of the, the error as alleged, I felt comfortable testifying as to that. Yeah. Um, so on a case-by-case -case basis, I'm willing to go beyond insurance agent and broker and real estate brokers, uh, depending on what the error alleged is. is. Right. I also feel comfortable dealing with insurance company claim department operations and whether they lived up to the standard of care as to how Fat, quickly, efficiently, and properly, they uh, investigated and resolved or didn't resolve a claim. And that includes excess of limit bad faith as well. Okay. Uh, especially, uh, and underscore this one, uh, especially when you're dealing with what's called uh, diminishing limit policy forms. In, uh, and I'll explain what that yeah, means. Yeah, please, because that is new, new, that's new terminology to me. Most, if not all, specialty line policies are written on the basis of uh, for every dollar of expense incurred in attorney's fees, for instance, 
the limit of liability is reduced by that amount. So if you def, if you've got a million dollar limit of liability, and you spend or the insurance company spends a hundred thousand dollars defending you, now you've only got nine hundred thousand dollars left for indemnification. Okay. Now, frankly, I, I, I don't okay. know if this is really true, but I believe it is. Uh, in 1985, I think. Yeah. I did a claim against a company that pooled money to make to, to bid uh, on oil lease lotteries. So when the oil leases were being uh, auctioned by the uh, Department of the Interior, I think. Okay. And they kind of blew it, no question about it. Um, they only had a half a million dollar limit of liability. They had thousands of potential claimants in that case. And I begged the insurance company to give me authority to settle. And they didn't. I, I don't want to, I have no, to this day, I'll never understand that. Why they wouldn't interplead the limits and let, let the claimants fight a lot for as to who gets the money and how little they'll get each. And they just wouldn't do it. That doesn't make any sense. Of course, he took the lid off a of policy. A policy limit demand was formally made. Uh, it was ignored. And the last time I heard about that case in the late early 1990s is that the insurance company had spent over $22 million defending the insured because the insured obviously had to go into bankruptcy. And between hiring bankruptcy counsel and everything else, it turned into a nightmare. And I can just hear the president of that insurance company in New York screaming at the top of his lungs that there isn't enough premium that you could charge to justify giving unlimited defense in these kind of policies, much like you have on your auto policy or your homeowners. Mm -hmm. No limited defense costs. There's no limit on that. Yeah. 22 million. And I'm certain that that's what sparked the introduction of what's called the diminishing limit policy form. Okay. And I handled that claim. Interesting. Interesting. Now, yeah. as a claim adjuster, uh, when I owned my uh, claims TPA, we went far beyond claim adjusting. We did qualitative claim audits uh, of, of insurance companies and other TPAs. So that's why I'm very comfortable with those kind of claims as well. I think we, uh, we came up with something like 58 performance standards we would look at in each claim file to determine whether it was well handled, timely handled, reserves adjusted properly, you know, et cetera. And while I will understand you can never guarantee success, what we looked for was to see that they were making a good faith attempt okay. to, to close the file quickly and expeditiously, or even just trying to make contact with the claimant. And it's right. We weren't expecting them to be able to finish that. I mean, sometimes you don't get any cooperation, but at least make the attempt. And so that's how we graded it. And uh, it was very effective. Um, actually, I think our 1987 audit of that, uh, uh, that self-insured rapid transit district was the first time it had been qualitative, it was a qualitative claim audit, but it was the first time it had been quantitatively proven. Okay. That if you staff the claim department properly to reduce the caseloads to manageable levels, that you will end up saving a, a, a lot of money in reserves, claim payments, and, and expense payments, and you should get a five-to-one return. Well, we were wrong. We got a 10-to-one return on that one. And that company adopted our recommendations. They doubled the contract price with their TPA so they could reduce the caseloads dramatically. And as a result, uh, over a six-year period, they saved over $60 million. And was this the one we had discussed that was because you they had adopted some of your standardization and, quali uh, and qualitative analysis? Is that yeah. the same? In my, yeah. Nick, can you expand on, on what they on the, what they did or what you had provided to them and, and what they did on that situation? Well, they doubled the claim staff. Okay. Okay. And they also reduced their panel counsel a little bit. And, and as a result, they had more time to control the files. And when we audited them, every the only files, claim files that were getting any kind of attention were those that were fires. Everything else was just sitting. And of course, you're paying rent at an attorney's office to continue the process of defending uh, the case until it became a fire, whether it was settlement conferences or trial or what have you. And, right. and it had been going on like that for several years. Then the claims were out of control. Interesting, interesting. And, so tell them, um, you know, we, we've had a couple of people join to kind of watch what's going on here. 
tell people you, you, you've been an expert witness now for 30 years. I like your stories about how you fell into this uh, expertise. And if you give give some folks a little background on how you got into it. Well, first of all, insurance is not exactly a destination profession, <laughs> although that is starting to change. Uh, you know, you don't go to college to become an insurance broker or a claim person. It happens by accident. And in my case, it's exactly what happened. I graduated from uh, University of California, Berkeley with a social science field major. What do you do but end up selling life insurance? Which I absolutely <laughs> hated. Meanwhile, I was going to law school at the same time. And boy, what a motivator. What kept me in law school those four years was my fear to end up selling insurance. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then ultimately, that's exactly what I ended up doing. But it wasn't life insurance, thank goodness. Um, I was doing I, what had happened in my third year in law school of a four-year program at the time. Um, I ended up getting a job with a malpractice uh, a claim adjusting firm that did malpractice claims in San Francisco. And they were representing an insurance company, or it's MGA. And we were handling claims against doctors and real estate brokers, insurance brokers, and Seedman's uh, E&O, and um, some miscellaneous accounts, even though that hadn't really become a big deal then. And, of course, we were also handling claims against lawyers. Okay. And for some whatever reason, I used to get a lot of those, those claims. And apparently I was good at it. I wasn't intimidated by anybody. I only took positions I knew were correct. Uh, and whether it was liability or coverage, what have you, I knew it was right. And, you know, when you know you're right, you know, you're not going to back down. Um, it was also interesting that here I am, I'm a third year law student. I get to walk into some of the attorney's office and look at them like, just what the heck were you thinking? <laughs> you know? But it was fascinating work. And when I graduated law school, I had like 11 job offers from defense firms. And, and part of the reason was I'd already had a couple of years experience as a law clerk. So I, I knew how um, a law firms functioned, especially on the defense side. I had had two years experience as an independent claim adjuster where I'm interviewing witnesses, interviewing or I mean, reviewing and, and, and analyzing documents, mm -hmm. uh, analyzing the case, settling the case. What I did that's 100% of what I did, and that's 80% of what defense lawyers might do, with the exception that they can go to court. Right, right. So I had this experience, and I had 11 job offers, but the firm had just opened up an office in Los Angeles and offered me the position of being its manager. And for whatever reason, I thought that was going to be a good, better springboard for me, and I, I, I accepted it. And uh, I think three years later, they made me a partner. And three years later, I ended up, buying, in essence, buying them out. Yeah. And it over. And I did that until 1995, until I got tired of handling claims. Okay. And then I became a wholesale broker. But by then, the economy was shifting away from manufacturing and more into uh, consulting errors and emissions and lots of consultants and computer consultants, et cetera. And uh, I knew that we could probably support our retail brokers better than our competitors. Mm -hmm. I understood how the policies worked in the real world. And I also knew where the gotchas were. And I would try and get them endorsed. And where I couldn't get them endorsed, I would disclose. I mean, we would tell our retail brokers, we like this policy over that one, and here's why. And so we really, really did what uh, I think is a duty to, it was up to the duty to advise, which is right now is a raging debate as to the standard of care of insurance brokers. Should you or should you not advise? And, and that kind of brings me into, into a topic that we've previously discussed that uh, others here and in, in this uh, stream have probably not heard about. And I can't recall if this goes back to a case that you're working on more recently. <laughs> that, like all of them. <laughs> yeah. But the where a broker holds themselves out as an expert and, and when they're not really an expert in a certain area and, and what kind of trouble that can get them into. Well, sure. The leading case, I think, is in California, at least, is Jones versus Gru, and that has been adopted by many other states. And that case involved the uh, allegation that they didn't recommend or provide high enough limits for that, that policyholder. And the court ruled there was no liability against the insurance broker because even though he was the representative of the insured, he had never agreed to undertake a risk management review. He was never asked to do a risk management review. He didn't hold himself out as an expert on, on limits as respects that type of coverage. 
and hadn't represented the insured for a length of time that might constitute creating a special relationship in and of itself. And so absent holding yourself out as an expert, absent agreeing to do a review or offering to do a review, uh, uh, et cetera, they found there was no liability. Now, frankly, uh, most policyholders will always say, oh, I thought I was covered for everything. He told me I was covered for everything. Well, number one, that doesn't exist. It's impossible to be covered for everything. Uh, number two, uh, limits. That's a big problem. No matter how much limits you are, you may want to buy if you can qualify. Mm -hmm. you, know, you might be able to get a million or even up to five million. But companies start looking at your net worth, whether you're a business or an individual, when you start looking for limits over 10, for sure. Okay. And then it, gets, it can get expensive. Right. But no matter how high of limits you buy, I can guarantee you there's always another claim that might, as remote as could be, might remotely take place. And now what you thought was enough is not. Yeah. There's always something else that could be worse. And there was a, an issue, and I, I I don't know if this was involved in, in the one we talked about earlier. Um, Richard, hold on one second. We will get to that. We're, we're talking mostly about insurance brokers in this situation here. Uh, but if you – oh, okay, he's on board with us now. Um the situation where a $3,800 policy could have been purchased and are, are, were you getting, were you heading towards that a little bit? Uh, yes, I was. That, Cause that's a fascinating fact pattern. Well, bear in mind what the traditional standard of care is. Now, a lot of people on their websites will advertise their expertise. They'll say what they do. In this instance, we're talking about an insurance brokerage that is in the top uh, for years, they've been in the top 50 of the largest privately owned insurance brokerages in the country, if not the world. Hundreds of millions in premium, hundreds of million in uh, in revenue to themselves. And they they offer the world. I mean, we've got a risk management department. We're going to customize your need. We're going to learn all about your needs and customize coverage to take care of your needs and on and on and on and on and on. In addition, they also used, uh, they use, also used uh, quoting um, proposals in word probably that have pro a lot of boilerplate language. Mm -hmm. There's actually ma uh, some. I, I know somebody actually created that using a lot of fancy macros and and uh, you just plug in the nature of the coverage and the pricing and the deductible and, and you get this proposal that you know again makes all sorts of wonderful representations about what you as a broker are doing right. or doing for the customer. And I think I counted something like twenty eight key representations, any one of which could create a special relationship, certainly any three of which, but here we got 28. Mm. And what had happened was they're representing a client where they're probably generating well over a million dollars a year in in um, premium, so that's over 100000 a year in revenue just for that one division, let alone the other divisions and subsidiaries. So they may even be looking at a million in revenue. Big policies, big accounts. I mean, one of the divisions uh, is the owner-operator of mental health hospitals. So these aren't small. This isn't a small company. Yeah. Um, but they did uh, need what's called a commercial builder's risk policy because they were renovating one of their facilities. Right. And um, it got it's a thirty-eight hundred dollar policy. Uh -huh. The commission on that probably is not more than four hundred and twenty-five dollars or yeah. four hundred and fifty. So you, one day you're working on a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollar premium policy, the next day you're working on a thirty-eight hundred dollar one. Uh, and I've always said, as a side note, uh, I've always said <clears throat> it's always that eight hundred dollar nonprofit D and O policy that comes back to give you a five million dollar E and O claim. Uh -huh. it, it takes much time in those policies as you might the big one, okay. because. They're going to have gotchas. Yeah. <clears throat> the premium size is not what's not what's relevant. It's what the policy says. Right. In this instance, they got a quote. No specimens were provided. They released the quote to the client with no specimens. Got an order to bind. How did anybody know what to buy? Um, got an order to bind, bound it. <clears throat> Eventually, the policy gets issued. And there's an endorsement on the policy 
that enhanced the coverage that wasn't quoted. Actually, the policy as quoted didn't cover anything. They had to add an enhancement endorsement so that there would be some coverage. But unfortunately, the policy didn't even get delivered to the policyholder until after the claim. In the claim, and, and I, if I recall uh, in our preparations, what you said that this thirty-eight hundred dollar policy covered was they were they were renovating a hospital, and it only covered the part being renovated. It only Correct. it, and then they had they were going to renovate the whole property, but the only part that was covered under the policy was that where where the renovation is, and unfortunately, when, especially when you're dealing with water damage that seeped through the ceiling. Uh, due to a subcontractor error, water has a mind of its own. It's going to go wherever it wants. Wherever it wants. And it did. And, and there was several million dollars worth of damages, allegedly. Ugh. And all of a sudden, now this huge brokerage firm is acting like, oh, we're, we didn't have a special relationship. We didn't hold ourselves out as experts. Uh, we just did what we were told to do. And it's like, okay, you really want to make that a public record? You really want to tell the other clients to know that that's going to be your position when there's a problem? Oh, and it wasn't now, the, there are times this, where that may be true. Don't get me wrong. Right. There are times that some companies and corporations do have sophisticated risk management departments, and they may know more about their needs than the broker does. Uh -huh. But that's not to say the broker doesn't know something about that policy form that the client needs to know as well that got missed. Maybe an obscurity thing or what have you. Or maybe they're slapping on an antitrust exclusion in the DNO policy that didn't have that last year. I got gotcha. you. And how yeah. important that might be. Um, you know, there are all sorts of gotchas. Um, you know, most of the time everybody's focused on the hazard to be insured. What they forget about is what's called the administration administrative part of the policy, the condition section. The definition section, uh, you know, those areas, there can be a lot of gotchas. And some of them could be quite hidden. Um, I know a policy that I consider highly restrictive. They charge 30 to 40 percent below market for employment practice insurance. But they also uh, exclude from coverage about 30 to 40 percent of the claims that might otherwise be covered. And that's how they can get away with charging so uh, being, having, being so price um, a, a competitive. One of the gotchas is, again, let's let's go back to claims made in reported forms. Mm -hmm. Policy requires a claim be first made against you during the policy term. It also requires that you uh, report the claim to the insurance company during the policy term. But this particular policy, and there are a few like it, they have an internal time bomb. In other words, as soon as you know about a claim, you only have 30 days to report it. Not the rest of the policy period. You have only 30 days. So it's not a claims made and reported form. It's a claims made and reported form within 30 days form. Now, most retail brokers today are kind of used to claims made and reported forms. Okay. And they have a basic understanding of what it's for. But do they expect to find a time bomb like that? And to make it worse, as I mentioned, also most, if not all, claims made policies also allow for uh, an, what's called an incident report. That as soon as you know of a problem that could give rise to a, a claim, mm -hmm. then in this policy form, you also had, again, 30 days from the date you first decided, I, we may have a claim out of this. Now you only got 30 days to report it. Okay. That's, I have never seen that. That's the, the, the only policy I've ever seen that has that language. Uh, to, to this day, that's still the only one you've seen that? Yes. Yes. 30 days instead of reporting limitation, yes. So we got about 15 minutes left. So let's have some some fun in in some of the ideas that we talk about. Tell me about what you think has been the most egregious thing that you've been been asked to uh, what's the most egregious insurance company or insured t thing that you've seen in well, your is there one that sticks out as a uh, as particularly egregious without giving away any confidential information, just the uh, fact pattern. Well, I'm not, not going to uh, mention any names, of course, no. but I was once an expert on a case that was just really, uh, really takes the cake. Again, it was a water damage case. And, what it, uh, and when the policy was first quoted, uh, 
they went uh, to a surplus lines carrier and are not admitted insurance company and a not admitted insurer doesn't have to necessarily use ISO forms. They can offer restricted coverage or, or even for that matter, highly enhanced coverage without having to go through the filing and approval process that an admitted carrier may want to do. Okay. This particular insured with a roofing company and, and I guess they previously been insured with an admitted carrier who was willing to renew, but for a you know, fair amount of money. And they shopped it and came up with a non-admitted carrier that was willing to charge a lot less. But there was one particular exclusion in it that had to do with um, rain damage and what the roofer, you know, uh, it was very ambiguously written. So the, they questioned the exclusion. And the underwriter, who happened to be a vice president, uh -huh. wrote back and said, well, if the insured does X, Y, and Z, I think there were four different things. Uh, if he does those four different things, we won't deny coverage. And that was in writing. Okay. So they it's passed on. The insurance satisfied. They buy in coverage. And they see an impending rainstorm coming uh, in California, which <laughs> kind of rain. Um, and uh, they do the four items that they're supposed to do. There's a water damage claim. The insurance company denies coverage. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, unfortunately, and, and, and this you know is creating a lot of problems for insurance brokers. Unfortunately, they were sued by obviously for breach of contract in bad faith, but the court decided decided there was a true and legitimate good faith dispute as to coverage, and they dismissed the bad faith case. And under the third eye blind decision in California. That meant that the only way, it means that what's going to happen here is that you may end up getting, you may win on coverage. You may get your hundred and fifty dollars or $200,000 in benefits you should have gotten in the first place. But you're out $300,000 in attorney fees. So now you're hundred grand or more in the hole. And so what do you do in that situation? Sue the insurance broker for failing to place the insured with a carrier who or insurer whose policy language was uh in dispute was um Uncon is it uncontestable uncontestable that's right that, that contained uncontestable language like what the heck <laughs> that's exactly what my thought was like how do you have something like that how that's do you get uncontestable language exactly the case and in this instance there was also a wholesale broker and, you know, they're advertising their expertise. They're advertising how good they are. And they're acting like, oh, no, we're just it, it, same thing. We're just a conduit for the retail broker. He sends us an app. We send it to the carrier. They send us a quote. We quote it to the retailer. And he tells us what to do. It's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I know what better than that is another case similar in the sense that they actually had on their website, direct, and, I'll, and I'm paraphrasing, Director and officer liability insurance is a very complicated form of coverage. Most retail generalists do not have the experience in dealing with director and officer liability that our that our team of experts does. We will partner with you and blah, 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 blah. Okay? So they ended up, so there's a claim against the co corporation and the team of experts at this wholesaler reported it to the wrong insurance company. Oh. Team of people and yeah. they reported the wrong. Oh wow! And, you know, again, in deposition, they were taken. It was obvious they were taking the position. Oh, we're just a conduit. We're just a conduit. Well, I had downloaded uh, their website pages and had them highlighted in yellow. And I also went to archive.org and make sure that I got a download of their website at the time of the acts complained of. So yeah. I had the before and after. Uh, dates sandwiching the, the date of alleged error, and I had all these highlighted in yellow. And before my deposition started, they wanted to go through my file to get a catalog so they could save time and in putting on the record everything that I reviewed, and you know, which is you know something I'm used to. And uh, I remember being warned in advance that you know most of the experts that had been deposed in the case, their depositions were taking about two hours, and I should plan for two hours. And I said, fine. And so they find this, this one attorney finds this stuff in my file. And he turns to the court reporter and he says, I think we're going to be here all day. 
and I was. I was there from 10. Uh, we started my deposition at 10.30 in the morning. We finished at 6.30 that evening. Okay. And, but from archive.org and from their website, didn't you find something on the homepage of the website that, that oh, was yeah. this? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I paraphrase it. You know, director and officer liability is too complicated a cover. Oh, okay. Okay. Must understand, and you know, people forget there's a reason why retail brokers go to utilize the services of a wholesaler. Right. There's basically, two reasons: um, to access markets you can't get to yourself, and or expertise. Okay. Now, at, when I owned uh, my insurance, my wholesale brokerage, we had a lot of retail brokers that would come to us for the expertise. Because they knew we had their back, or it would cover, protect them, even when they had the ability to deal direct with the insurance company. Because they knew we'd do a better job for them, that we would get endorsements. We wouldn't accept the standard form policy and endorsements. They might quote, "We were getting them fixed and rewritten before we even released terms." Right. And I don't think there was one policy we ever sold that didn't cross my desk by personal review. For personal but, review. Exactly. So I remember once uh, one of my favorite defense lawyers once kind of chastised me. He says, Fred, do you realize that what you're doing? I said, what are you talking about? He says, if when you fail to do that, just once you're going to get an E&O claim. And I said, well, yes, but I'll trade that for the 500 I didn't get. <laughs> right. right. Because here's the problem. If you follow this, what the true standard of care is, which unless you enter into a special relationship with your customer, you're really an order taker. Right. You just do what the insured asks you to do, and you must do so diligently and in good faith. But uh, um, so you can escape liability. Mm -hmm. but what's that mean? It means you get sued. You got to right. do the discovery. You got to go to trial, and you have to have, satisfy a jury that you were just a conduit and an order taker that you right. promised nothing, and then you can win. That's that's the standard of care. And that's but hard if you get 10 right. or 15 of those in a two- or three-year period, guess what? Nobody's going to insure you for errors and emissions, and if they're willing to, they're going to put a high deductible on it because they don't, because you've got a frequency problem even though you're doing nothing wrong. Right. And to right. me, while it's not necessarily the standard of care, I think it's better to conduct yourself in a way as a professional that prevents claims and that you document it because you can never stop somebody from suing you. Right. But if you're well documented, you can, you can prove that you did what you're supposed to do and not to get out early. And you're talking about doing the right thing from the beginning, essentially. And, you know, if you have expertise, use it. Utilize and you, it. Share and it. if you don't, don't advertise that you do. That's right. <laughs> Precisely. Because, you know, either you're going to be either inside or outside Jones versus Drew. And to me... You want to do what you say you're going to do, and otherwise you you could be in deep deep uh, trouble. Yeah. So with the five minutes left, uh, five or you know three three to five, is there anything we didn't cover that you know in this replay you would want an attorney to know within with just you know a couple of minutes? Uh, I'd like you yeah. to cover where they can find you. Uh, well, I'd like one, you. I'm available. They can find me easily on LinkedIn, but. I'm Fred Fisher. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you're on, you're on experts.com. I'm going to post yeah, that link. Experts.com for, oh, sure, for sure. I mean, that's all to where we are. Actually, I think you're one of the uh, better services I'm with. I think I've gotten more referrals from experts.com than anybody else. And, of course, you're providing some great services, well, thank uh, you, like thank this you. interview. And I know we've discussed doing some webinars in the future. In the future um, yeah. And for all the attorneys out there, I do teach an insurance 101 class. And it's not on insurance law. It's how the insurance industry is conducted on a day-to-day -day basis, how claims departments function, how products are distributed, how policies are written and filed, and why. Reinsurance, what's that? You know, and, and all these are important if you're going to be either on the defense or plaintiff side, is having a good understanding of the day-to-day -day operations of the insurance industry and how uh, coverage is, is uh, produced and, and uh, distributed. Otherwise, how can you how can you prosecute a case properly or defend so one do that for free yeah uh, we've been doing that for a long time but in addition there's another issue 
it drives me crazy when I get a phone call from an attorney and he says, are you available to t- take this case? They said, sure, when do you have to disclose? And he says, today or tomorrow, or <laughs> Friday. Or, uh, well, uh, we have to disclose a month, but I need a, but I have to have a written report by the end of the week. Well, you know, scramble. I, I may have the time to be able to do it once he tells me what the case is about. But <clears throat> more importantly, it doesn't cost anything to pick up the phone and call me a year earlier and <clears throat> run the case by me because I may have ideas back then that you can implement uh, as to discovery, evidence, issues. And often when I get a phone call saying, uh, we need you and, and uh, we need to disclose, discovery is already closed. Yeah. And now you can't get additional information that I consider potentially valuable. It doesn't and- cost anything. Give me a call and talk and, for an hour. And you can help with with strategy and things that they may not know what to ask <clears> for <throat> from the beginning. And I would oh, think, yeah. and, and, and you know, if I were to go out and practice right now and, and do insurance uh, plaintiff's work for uh, or defense work, I wouldn't know what to ask for in one of my early cases. So, but if I reach out to you, you might guide me in the strategy exactly. to begin with. I was involved in a case as actually I was one of three mediators and the one of the parties had come up with a theory, actually the party that hired me as one of the as their neutral supposedly. Um they had uh they had chosen a strategy that was I, I thought was kind of uh, interesting. Unfortunately they, they hadn't gotten the discovery that was really important. And there I was sitting on this panel on and I'm I'm allowed to ask questions in, in, in this binding arbitration. I was allowed to ask questions of the witnesses if I felt the need. And I'm cross-examining the corporate counsel for the plaintiff. And I'm asking all the questions that, as far as I'm concerned, the lawyer who hired me should have been asking all along and did, never did. And I'm asking questions about loss reserves and, and the loss runs they produced. And the fact, gee, here we have a construction book of business, and there's no subrogation recovery anywhere. Now, one is there ever been a construction program where there was no subrogation recovery? Right. Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. So contact you early. Search up, search for Frederick Fisher. That is my guest today. Uh, we will uh, get this uh, again. I'm Nick Rishwain. I'm with Experts.com. My guest today was Frederick Fisher, professional liability specialty lines insurance expert and expert witness. Uh, and you can search him online. You search him on experts.com. This uh, replay will be available. Uh, and we'll also, in, in the next day or two, Fred, what I'll do is I'll convert it into a YouTube video, send that over to you so you can reuse it as well. I think our quality has been much better today. Uh, and uh, I'm going to thank you for being here today, and then I'll stop the recording. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. It's been a pleasure. And, my, and thank you, experts.com. This is a great service, and I really love uh, what you guys are doing. Thank you.